if you're going to actually do this, then James gives some illustrations about how to do it. You know, keep your tongue. Take care of those who can't take care of themselves. Keep yourself pure and unspotted from the world. Stop showing partiality. You know, he just gives some ideas about how to do these things. So that's where we're going with all of this. That's why it's so important to spend week after week trying to, trying to figure out just how do we study this. Because remember the thing we said in, in one of the first weeks? Of, we do this because it's of ultimate personal significance, right? And so we spend this time digging into this word because we're wanting it to transform us. All right, questions or comments, observations, thoughts thus far? Yes, sir. Okay, well, maybe you need a better translation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so back, to, back to what I said a few weeks ago that I never can say enough. You don't ever just read the Bible. It reads you. If the, if the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, you're throwing yourself on the sword and you're inviting it. I like David's prayer. Search, search me. Know me, right? Uh, let, let the Spirit slice and dice and expose those places in your heart and life that are out of track with his will and his word, and then let the great physician heal you there. That's a good, that's a good observation. All right, somebody else. Yeah. And you know what? That's, that's, the, the, the world is keenly aware of when you and I show up in these cathedrals and go through our religious rituals and then go out there and do what they do. The, the world is keenly aware of that. And that is a, that is a credibility destroying contradiction. When we sit in here and, 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 and pursue this word and then don't live it out. And that's why, you know, we have this charge of hypocrisy, right? This is one of the charges Jesus made against the Pharisees. They sit in Moses' seat, and they can tell you what to do and not to do, but don't follow them because they don't practice what they preach. And people just get... Uh, did you all see the, did you see the story that uh, came out of Abilene yesterday? <laughs> uh, there's a new Hooters restaurant going in, I guess close to the campus of, of ACU. And uh, Abilene folks have asked their students not to apply for jobs there. And uh, Fox News picked it up. Conservative Texas church tells students avoid Hooters. <laughs> you know, uh, wasn't tr tr Trump tweeting yesterday? Was it a slow news cycle? What was happening? But this has made, made headline news, and I made the mistake. Sometimes reading the comments are good. Like when you read about all these Oregon people that can't pump their own gas. When they comment on those things, that, that's, that's some funny stuff. But I made the, 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 the mistake of reading the comments. And when you read the comments of a story like that, it's just very clear. The line of demarcation is just very clear between those who follow Jesus and those, those who don't. Those who don't follow Jesus can't understand why a Christian school would say, don't do this. Right? Um, and what they say is, you know, what a, what a farce, what a hypocrisy. We know what college students do. And, and, we, you know, and they just think it's all hypocritical. Every time we talk about sex, it's, it's, it's hypocritical because we're always bashing one group of people but not living according to the Bible's actual teachings about sexuality and things like that. So we have to be very careful. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, if we're going to parade this book around, we better be sure we're living by it. That's, that, that's happening right here in the church. We're getting the Hooters? Rock, rock. Oh. I mean, I 
I made this statement uh, at the hospital about uh, I hope no college students work for me. And the guy said, uh, decided to say, what, what right does the college have to tell students where they can work? I said, it's all about reputation. Mm. We have to maintain a reputation as Christians. We're like a book. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we may be the only Bible that somebody ever reads. And what impression of the Lord are they going to get of us? Right? They can say, you know what? They do everything that we do, and we don't have all the guilt. So come on over to our side. All right, any other observations or comments? Yes, sir. Mm. And I, I try to read the scriptures as who we must become rather than what I must do. Mm-hmm. I get that. I get that. But you know, what we must become is based in large part on what we, what we do. Yeah, yeah, we, 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 um, we hear about youngsters all the time. We say, well, he's not a bad kid. He just, just made a bad decision. At some point, you actually are a bad kid. You know what I'm saying? At some point, you keep making that decision. You have no desire to, to go that way. And so those two are so intimately connected. But I think it, it, it may be just the psychological power of it. When we put it in terms of what I have to do or what I shouldn't do, it feels very onerous. It feels very regulatory. It feels very... When we say who I must become like Jesus, like God, that speaks more of transformation. You know, it, should, it, it may just be semantics in the way we say it. We get, the same, we get to the same place, right? But it's an attitude of mind that looks at it one way or looks at it another way. It's the difference between, do I do this so God will love me, or uh, because God has loved me, I will do this. I, you, you get to the same place either way, but... Man, the way you get there and the way you say it, the way you feel and think about it, totally different, right? Even in, even in the heart. Because if, if we're really in love with Christ and doing Him, we're living Him, mm -hmm. the rest of it kind of falls in place. And there's more freedom in doing that than, oh my gosh, I messed up and I'm out, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mm. All right, good stuff. Um, yeah. I think we need to remember that we need to be study in community. That mm. ourselves. That I'm not bringing up kids through this. I need community and people all come together. That's good. That's another one of those controls that we put on the text that keeps us from going crazy with it, right? Um, you know, we live, we're now at 2018, and in the last three or four years, all of a sudden, we've discovered something about human sexuality that we've never known before. Is that true? I, I, I'm, I'm always interested uh, to hear college students in my classes explain uh, homosexual marriage and the homosexual lifestyle. And one of the questions I want to ask is, so are you saying to me that the church has been misinterpreting this for over 2,000 years? Or are you saying that the, 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 the Jews have been misinterpreting this passage for, for 4,000 years? There's something to be said for what Paul calls the traditions that have been handed down. And when Paul talks about tradition, he's not talking about... You know, we immediately... This is, this is 1 Thessalonians 2. When we hear the word tradition, we immediately jump to a negative connotation. Tradition. Tradition. It wasn't that way for Paul. 
Tradition was the authoritative word of God that had been preserved and passed down and that ought to still be applied. Right? And so when you read something in community, uh, it's, it's a controlling element, right? It's not to say that the community is infallible, but if the Spirit is at work in the community, well, you make a very good point. Some of you have made the decisions you're going to read through the Bible this year. Let me ask you, are you reading for depth or distance? Uh, do you understand the difference? Reading for distance, I don't necessarily even try to pronounce those names. I go, oh, names, next chapter. <laughs> Uh, reading for distance. I don't necessarily try to understand, Joe, all of the laws in Leviticus. I just go, wow, that's gory. Good next chapter. Do you read for depth or distance? I mean, it's great to read through the Bible in a year, but if you don't understand what you're reading, is it really helpful? And so what I'd like to start with now, and uh, carrying on into next week, is how to give the text a serious reading. How to give it a serious reading. And I want to start off by asking you, have you ever received a love letter? Oh, let me make it even more difficult. Have you ever received a letter from a girl or guy that you liked, but you weren't sure that they liked you? You thought maybe, but you weren't sure. And so you read this letter, you got a letter. A text. Oh, texts are even better, right? Because you can't see the little, the little heart dot over the eye, right? What do you do with that when you're, when you're reading it? How do you read it? I, I remember when I was chasing Rachel. That could be the name of a movie, Chasing Rachel. Uh... She, she agreed to go out with me the first moment I ever talked to her. All right? I was the preacher at her church up in Portia, and I really needed a girlfriend. And I got done teaching my auditorium class that morning, and I, 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 I am not kidding you at all when I tell you this story. I looked around the auditorium, and I said, I need a date. Who is it going to be? Well, there was this one girl in the audience. She was sitting on the back row between her mother and her grandmother, and I said, that's her. I walked straight back there, and I said, I'm going to a concert tonight. Would you go with me? And she said, okay. Now, little did she know that I was actually performing, and that, you know, I kind of sealed the deal at that moment. But anyway, um, the next two years I spent pursuing her. The, the, see, the problem was she had a boyfriend at the time, Okay. And she had this boyfriend until the night she called him and said, hey, we're going to have to break up. And he said, why? She said, because I'm getting married. But it's, it's, it's a whole story there. Uh, during that two years, I'm living at, in Searcy in the dorms, and she's going to ASU. And, and it was back in the day before texting and stuff, you know, in the dark ages. And so we, she would write me these letters. It's Sunday nights, before I would drive back, to Cersei. We get out of church at Portia. We go to the Pizza Den in Hoxie, okay? And then I'd go on. And, and she'd leave me these letters, and, I, and I'm like, I know she knows that I like her, and I'm trying to woo her. And she's writing me these letters, and I'm sitting there, and I'm analyzing every line and every word, looking for something. You know what I'm talking about? Looking for a hint. You know, how do I understand this? It could mean this, it could be that. I'd come down here and I'd get my buddies and I'd go, how would you interpret this? You know, and I would agonize over this letter. And I would say, this proves it. You know, surely she loves me. Or this proves it, surely she doesn't. I mean, she had to agonize every line and every, every nuance. Do you read the Bible like that? I mean, those letters were really important to me. Right? And obviously, I eventually won, right? He's no more. I won. Um, those letters were so important to me because they communicated something that was very dear to me and that would affect my life. And, and I spent hours with them. Still have them. Still have them. Some of you do too. You still have those love letters or love texts archived somewhere. 
Have you ever read the Bible like that? Poured over every word. I, <laughs> I want to tell you about my affinity for country music in the <laughs> sermon this morning. But I was driving home yesterday and I was listening to George Jones. And, uh, well, well I, I, I drove past that car lot in Judsonia with the picture of uh, Vladimir Putin where it says, eat more possum. And I thought, oh, George Jones, I need to listen. <laughs> and so <laughs> I started listening to uh, He Start Loving Her Today. You know that song? And there's a line in that song that says, he kept all these love letters and he'd underlined every single, I love you. Right? Do you read the Bible like that? Do you even know how? Do you even care? So what we're going to do next week is we're going to say, okay, how do I read? When I read, for depth or distance? Well, distance is good, depth is better. And we're going to talk about next week how we can read for depth. All right, pick up there next week.